This year sees the celebration of the anniversary of the greatest revolution in transport since man first rode upon a horse's back. 150 years ago, in 1830, a group of people built the first proper railway line in the world across 30 miles of Lancashire between Liverpool and Manchester. It's now a comparatively insignificant detail in the vast system which it fathered, but this railway remains virtually unchanged and in daily use. It is perhaps the foremost industrial monument in this country. Not that it was the first railway in the world or even the first to use steam locomotives, but it was the first to combine all the essential elements of a modern railway. It carried both passengers and freight, it provided a public service under the authority of an act of parliament, and it was worked from the start solely by steam engines. Called at the time the Grand British Experimental Railway, it turned a scattered collection of ideas, hopes and theories into a practical and efficient transport system which changed the world into the one we live in today. The story begins here in Liverpool, which by the 1820s had overtaken Bristol as the leading seaport in the land. From all over the world, ships brought goods to Britain through these docks. Sugar, yarn, rum, tobacco, and above all, cotton. The first consignment of eight bags of cotton arrived here in 1784. And ironically enough, it was seized by the customs over a bureaucratic technicality. By 1820, 300,000 bags of cotton a year were being unloaded here from America alone. But Liverpool's growth didn't rely solely on imports. This harbour was the channel through which Britain's exports passed too. Salt from Cheshire, pottery from the black country, the iron and cotton products of Manchester and Yorkshire. Manchester was also the big distribution centre for most of the goods coming through Liverpool. It was also the prime market for Merseyside's rich agricultural produce. By the 1820s, the strain on the existing roads and canals between the two cities had become intolerable. The road was narrow, crooked, crowded and bumpy. The fastest stagecoach took at least three hours, and the freight went mainly by pack horse, which naturally took much longer. There simply wasn't enough capacity for the volume of goods involved even on the canals, which had been built about 60 years earlier to ease the strain on the roads, while well, the situation there was hardly any better. Journey time was up to 36 hours or more. Goods were liable to delay or even loss in storms on the Mersey, which one of the routes had to use. And to make matters even more complicated, a corrupt system of monopolies operated by the three canal companies kept the cost of freight transport by water artificially high. Small wonder then that a group of Liverpool merchants decided to look for alternative ways of moving both people and goods between the two cities. Railways, or at least men pushing wagons around on primitive tracks, had been around in one form or another since the 1600s. But it was only since the 1800s that engineering and ironworking techniques had produced rails, trucks and locomotives strong enough to shift heavy loads. For 10 years, steam engines had shared the work with horses on the colliery lines in the northeast, and the Liverpool businessmen were quick to see that railways might answer their needs here. In 1822, the railway company was formed and surveying work started. Liverpool provided the impetus, the idea, and most of the money too. Of the £400,000 subscribed to build the line, only £12,000 came from Manchester. The man the railway company finally settled on to build their line was George Stevenson. Then in his early 40s, he knew more about railways and steam engines than anyone else alive. He and his son Robert had made over half the working engines in England by the middle 1820s, 15 of them. There's plenty of water in this time, Robert. Why, aye. He taught himself how steam engines worked by taking them to pieces and repairing them. He wasn't averse to borrowing other people's ideas, but he had an extraordinary flair for practical innovation. He designed a new miner's safety lamp and a baby's cradle rocked by smoke from the chimney stack. But above all, he built engines and laid railway lines at Killingworth, Hetton and Springwell collieries, culminating in the construction of the Stockton and Darlington Railway. It was no surprise then that Stevenson should have his appetite whetted by the Liverpool project. Here, Mr. Stevenson. All right. Not long, mind. He knew locomotives worked, but here was an opportunity to build a railway on a grand scale, with steam as the sole motive power. Nobody had even begun to realise that the railway revolution was underway. The idea may have started at the quayside, but the line certainly didn't. The city fathers wouldn't allow the rails to cross Dock Road, so they started down here, in what became the Wapping Goods Station. It was here that goods wagons were loaded and unloaded, but the locomotives? They never came down here. 
You see, they were banned within the city limits for fear of explosions and pollution. So the wagons were hauled up and down the tunnel to Edge Hill on an endless rope over a mile long, worked at the top by stationary steam engines. Well, that was how they handled the goods. This is where they handled the people. This was Crown Street, the original passenger terminus. Crown Street then was on the very edge of the city. It's hardly that now, it's pretty much in the thick of it. Within six years, it was superseded by the big station, Lime Street, because Liverpool decided very quickly indeed that it quite liked steam engines and they fancied a fine station in the heart of the city. It's also fascinating to find out that these lumps here, these lumps of very ordinary looking stone, are in fact some of the original stone sleepers from the Liverpool Manchester Railway 150 years ago. See, in those days, they didn't use wood very much because they hadn't learned how to creosote it and it rotted, so they used stone instead. And they trundled all these blocks across when they abandoned the old passenger terminus and brought these over here to make them buffers for a later goods depot. But for quite a time, this was Liverpool's railway station. Passengers were brought here by road from the company's office in Dale Street. Here they boarded the railway coaches, which then rumbled down the Crown Street Tunnel by sheer force of gravity to rendezvous with the locomotives at Edge Hill, just like the goods wagons from Wapping. This tunnel is as good a place as any to pay tribute to the unsung heroes of the railways, the navvies. A whole host of labourers armed with picks, shovels and gunpowder made tunnels, cuttings and embankments. They changed the face of the landscape. They came from Ireland or off the farms. Some of them had built canals. The former were mostly veterans of the Stockton and Darlington line. The work, that was hard and dangerous. An eyewitness in 1829 noted the characteristics which were to become the hallmark of the Victorian navvy, already evident in the men who built the Liverpool and Manchester Railway. The men, who were the finest workmen in Europe, dig out 25 cubic yards of heavy clay each day. But their desire to run to the public houses and get drunk is so great that many of them perform their day's work in a few hours. These dissolute men exert themselves so violently in their work that I've seen many powerful, muscular men with their blood oozing out of their eyes and nostrils. 25 cubic yards of clay each day, that's about the volume of a lane of a public swimming bath. And each man cleared that each day. No wonder they needed a drink. This rock cutting at Edge Hill is a monument to the navvies. This was it under construction. And this is it now. This is the passenger tunnel from Crown Street. This huge one here, this is the Wapping Tunnel, the goods tunnel from Wapping, over a mile long. But no travellers got on or off here, except maybe to admire the place, and you can see why, it really is sensational. This was a place devoted to the locomotives. This is where they were coupled to their trains, where they were oiled and coaled, watered and turned. These small hollows here were places where lamps were filled with oil, stores were issued, locomotives repaired, and where the drivers and firemen rested and ate. This is where the locomotives lived. In there, they were shedded, and in there, and in those two smaller caves over there as well. And this is where the train journey to Manchester really began. But it's desolate now, abandoned and bypassed long ago. Those two big chimneys, one on each side there, they've gone. So too has that lovely Moorish arch which spanned the entire track just behind where I am. But it was a very different sight indeed on the opening day, September the 15th, 1830. For days before, the roads to Liverpool were clogged with people converging here from all over the country. The Duke's carriage was the finest of all. The engine was Northumbrian, the newest on the line, and George Stevenson himself was on its footplate. As the crowds cheered and waved, the band played, and a cannon sounded the signal for departure. But this wasn't the first time that passengers had travelled on the Liverpool and Manchester Railway. 
On August the 25th, 1830, a select little party had been invited to ride on the railway. George Stevenson was both the host and the engine driver. Among the guests was the celebrated actress Fanny Kemble. She was one of the theatrical superstars of the day. She'd wowed them in the aisles at Covent Garden, she was playing in Liverpool, and it wasn't difficult for her to swing a ride on the train. Well, I will then. Thank you, William. Oh, yeah. Well, what do you think of it? Oh, she's beautiful. <laughs> yes. You stand back on her feet. Well, that's the boiler there. Now, that's the important part. The water in there is heated by this, uh, well, you call it a stove, like you've got in the kitchen at home. <laughs> She's fired by the coal back there. Yes. Now, uh, we've got the water stored in that big barrel at the back. The important thing that we've got to look at is the, uh, the glass valve there, you see? That tells us when she's got enough water in. <laughs> now, she goes by working the regulator. You see that, uh, that lever there? Mm -hmm. That controls the steam into these pipes, which flow along here into the piston. And the pistons go... Up and down, and we'll drive the big wheel round and round, and away we'll go. <laughs> you right, then? I hope it doesn't go too fast. I don't like the look. No, 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 no. I, uh, I wondered, uh, you think you'd like to ride up on the footplate? Yes, I'd love to. Wonderful. Great. Well, look, I'll, I'll better go for it. You like that? There, now. Almost at starting, the railroad was cut through the solid rock which formed a wall on either side of it, about 60 feet high. You can't imagine how strange it seemed to be journeying on thus without any visible cause of progress other than the magical machine. And when I reflected that these great masses of stone had been cut asunder to allow our passage thus far below the surface of the earth, I felt as if no fairy tale was ever half so wonderful as what I saw. Bridges were thrown from side to side across the top of these cliffs, and the people looking down upon us from them seemed like pygmies standing in the sky. After proceeding through this rocky defile, we presently found ourselves raised upon embankments ten or twelve feet high. In those early days, the view from the Roby embankment was a source of great wonder and delight to passengers along the line. It was built from rock taken from the Olive Mount cutting and gave passengers an elevated view over the countryside they'd never seen before. A contemporary writer describes the embankment as a pier running out into a sea of verdure. Times have certainly changed. But it wasn't just the landscape which startled those early passengers. It was the sudden advance in speed over anything they'd known before. Some people thought that railway travel would cause all manner of horrors to the human frame. It was even said that the body would explode over certain speeds. For some people, their first journey by rail was the most exciting adventure imaginable. For others, it was a frightening and grimy experience. The whole train was going at the rate of 35 or 40 miles an hour. The scene was magnificent. I had almost said terrific. Although it was a dead calm, the wind appeared to be blowing a hurricane. Yet, 
all was steady, and there was something in the precision of the machinery that inspired a degree of confidence over fear, of safety over danger. A man may travel from the pole to the equator, from the Straits of Malacca to the Isthmus of Darien, and he will see nothing as astonishing as this. This motion is to me frightful. It is really flying, and it is impossible to divest yourself of the notion of instant death to all upon the least accident happening. It gave me a headache which has not left me yet. You cannot conceive what that sensation of cutting the air was. The motion is as smooth as possible, too. I could either have read or written. And as it was, I took my bonnet off and stood up and drank the air before me. The wind, which was strong, or perhaps the force of our own thrusting against it, absolutely weighed my eyelids down. When I closed my eyes, this sensation of flying was quite delightful and strange beyond description. Yet I had a perfect sense of security and not the slightest fear. The smoke is very inconsiderable indeed, but sparks of fire are abroad and in some quantity. One burnt Mr. Ross's cheek, another a hole in Lady Maria's silk pelisse, and a third a hole in someone else's gown. Sefton is convinced that some damnable thing must come of it. But he and I seem more struck with such apprehension than others. It wasn't just accidents that people were afraid of. The landed gentry feared that railways would overturn the social order. The masses would be free to move around the country and to take their labor and their votes with them. So when, back in 1825, the company applied to Parliament for an act to build the line, the opposition banded together to have the bill thrown out. They needn't have worried. George Stevenson unwittingly did all their work for them at the committee stage. Were you exposed to any inconvenience in taking your surveys? We were. On whose property? On my Lord Sefton's and Lord Darby's, and particularly on Mr. Bradshaw's part. I believe you came near the coping of some of the canals. Well, I believe I was threatened to be ducked in a pond if I proceeded. And of course, we had a lot of the survey to take by stealth while the persons were at dinner. We well, couldn't get it at night because we were watched day and night. And guns were discharged over the grounds belonging to Captain Bradshaw to prevent us. I can't state further that I was twice threatened to be turned off the ground myself. Thank you, Sergeant Spanky. Mr. Alderson, your witness. Did you ask to plead? I did. To whom? Lord Darby and Lord Sefton, and they denied me leave. Was that before any survey was attempted to be taken? Well, there had been some attempts to take the levels, but not a proper survey. Do you suppose it is a likely thing to obtain leave from any gentleman to survey his land when he knew that your men had gone upon his land to take levels without his leave? And he himself found them going through the corn and through the gardens of his tenants and trampling down the strawberry beds which they were cultivating for the Liverpool market. I have sometimes found it very difficult to get through places of that kind. <laughs> Where do you propose to begin your railroad? Oh, it's shown on the plan. Mm, and how do you propose to unite Charles Street after you cut through it? Let it remain as it is. That would be an odd sort of street with a hole of 15 feet depth in it. We propose to throw a bridge over it. But how do you propose to go over it? We will go under it. What will be the height of your bridge? Fifteen feet. And the depth? Two feet. Will a locomotive engine go under that? They will not go under it. Will a locomotive engine go through it? They will, by lowering of the chimneys of the engines, which may be done at an expense of 30 or 40 shillings each. What is the height of the uh, machine's body? Six and a half, seven feet. Mm -hmm. And the top of the piston moving? You know what I mean. You know the object of my question. Ten or twelve feet. Ten or twelve feet. Well, which would it be? 
Well, I can make it either. Well, which do you <clears throat> intend to make it? It has something to do, you know, with the height of bridges. I have not yet determined. Can you determine what would happen should a cow stray upon the railroad line in the path of a locomotive engine racing at ten miles an hour? Would not that, think you, be a very awkward circumstance? Why, very awkward. Well, a cow. <laughs> What is the height of the bridge over the River Irwell, the intended one? Um, 20 to 15 feet. Will you not say it is 10 feet, according to the plan? Yeah, perhaps it might be, sir. So. Immediately upstream of your intended bridge, there is another at Eccles, is there not? Yes, I believe there is. And what is the height of that Eccles bridge above the level of the water? Is it not 25 feet? I think it's somewhere near to it. Hmm. So, your bridge is only 10 feet high, while the Eccles Bridge at 25 feet is itself insufficient sometimes for carrying off the water. I don't know that. Oh, did you not make any inquiries? Well, I didn't think it was a matter of great importance to do so. What was the original baseline upon which all your levels are calculated, as marked upon the section? Near the uh, Vauxhall Road at Liverpool. Or where about? Any one definite point I shall be glad to have. About 160 yards from them, I'm not quite sure. You do not believe that you are out in your levels? I have based my levels on estimates which I believe to be correct. Do you believe I or know that your levels are correct? Well, I have heard it reported that, that they're not. Did you take the levels yourself? They were taken for me. Other people took them for you. And upon their estimate, you have made your estimate? Yes. began to wish for a hole to crawl into. Some members of the committee asked if I was a foreigner. And another hinted that I was mad. Not surprisingly, the bill was thrown out, George Stevenson was fired, and was replaced by the leading engineers of the day, John and George Rennie, who prepared new plans and surveys. But to cover themselves, the company decided to buy off the opposition. Their main target was the Marquis of Stafford, who had inherited the Bridgewater Canal from his uncle. After protracted negotiations, a simple but effective deal was struck by the pro-railway MP William Huskisson. It just so happens that he'd been the Marquis's secretary in the British Embassy in Paris during the French Revolution and therefore knew him well. He persuaded the Marquis to take £100,000 of shares in the railway company. The combination of the Marquis's support and the professional and accurate survey of the Rennies carried the day. The bill became law in 1826. But the company then fired the Rennies under a pretext and appointed as chief engineer the man they'd always really wanted to build the railway, George Stevenson. In order to get the bill through the second time, they dropped all mention of running the railway by steam engines. The Rennies favoured horse-drawn trains, and they designed the line without any severe gradients at all. But as soon as Stevenson was back in charge, he changed the plans by substituting two gradients of one in 96 at each end of this long, very flat stretch of line here. It was said by some at the time that that was to ensure that horses would not be used on the line, because, you see, horses simply wouldn't be able to pull a loaded train up such a gradient. That left a choice between stationary engines which pulled wagons up inclines like these in the northeast and steam locomotives. They settled on the stationary engines to work the gradients at Rainhill and Edgehill and locomotives to do the rest. They knew that stationary engines could do their part of the job. What they didn't know was whether anybody could build a substantially better locomotive than the ones they already had none of which was really good enough to clinch the matter in favour of locomotives.
they decided to hold a competition with a prize of £500 for the most improved engine. The entrants were to compete in terms of endurance and power. And the place where the trials were to be held was chosen quite simply because it was and is a long, straight, level track. It's now probably the most famous railway place in the world, Rain Hill. And its name is inextricably linked with that of the most famous engine in the world, of course, the rocket. And even today, British Rail can perpetuate the myth that George Stevenson built the rocket. Well, he didn't. His son Robert did in Newcastle, 150 miles away, to a design quite properly credited to the two Stevensons and to Henry Booth, the company treasurer. Many people had offered entries, but some never appeared on the day. Of the more serious ones, there were four apart from the rocket. The novelty entered by a Swedish sea captain, John Ericsson, and his English partner, John Braithwaite. Son Parai, built by Timothy Hackworth, resident engineer of the Stockton and Darlington line. Perseverance, which was entered by Timothy Burstall of Edinburgh. And Cycloped, built by Thomas Brandreth and worked by a horse. The stage was set. People came from across the world to see which was the best engine. For eight days, the future of the steam locomotive hung in the balance. The load assigned to each locomotive engine shall be three times its own weight. Fuel shall be weighed, and as much water shall be measured and delivered into the tender carriage as the owner of the engine may consider sufficient for the supply of the engine for a journey of 32 miles and one half. 500 weight, Mr. Stevenson. I hope there's the best nuts, The fire in the boiler shall then be lighted, and the quantity of fuel consumed for getting up the steam shall be determined and the time noted. I wouldn't bother to go any further. This one's going to be the winner. Each engine shall make 20 trips over the course, which shall be equal to the travelling from Liverpool to Manchester and back again. The average rate of travelling shall not be less than 10 miles per hour. The time of performing each even trip shall be accurately noted. As soon as steam is got up to 50 pounds per square inch, the engine shall set out upon its journey. Is rocket ready? Uh, rocket's ready. Uh, clear down the line. Yes.
Well, that was a very good first run by Rocket. Not bad at all. Who's next? Well, I think it's Cyclopel, the horse machine. Oh, yes, 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 Cyclopel. Thomas Brandreth, Esquire, has patented his one-horsepower mechanical trolley, though he is protected against the theft of his idea by its very folly. He could never, however, be wholly protected against the wrath of the equine engine should the unfortunate beast ever realise how much it is laughed at. In the event, the horse resigned its office summarily and will doubtless advise its fellow creatures to reject all Brandreth's subsequent offers of employment. The first stall from Edinburgh upset his locomotive in bringing it from Liverpool to Rain Hill. He dropped it off its cart and spent the week in pretending to remedy the injuries, whereas he altered and amended some part every day. Oh, mind your head. Mind your head. Oh. I told you to mind your head. The London engine of Braithwaite and Ericsson, called the Novelty, was a light one. No chimney upright, but a boiler blown by a blast by bellows. Two six-inch cylinders work a bell crank lever to turn the axle, a very weak form of axle. A man will need not fear you, I'm thing. Got me guts. <laughs> Boiler, bellows, flues, etc., were all covered with copper, like a new tea urn, all of which tended to give her a very parlour like appearance. Is the line clear? Ready? Ready! She started well enough, but had a terrible mishap, an explosion of inflammable gas which burst her bellows. Timothy Hackworth has been very sadly out of temper ever since he came, for he has been grobbing on day and night, and nothing that was done for him was right. He was most unhappy with the tender. He openly accused all Stevenson's people of conspiring to hinder him, of which I do believe them innocent. Saint-Parai burns nearly double the quantity of coke that the rocket does and mumbles and roars and rolls about like an empty beer butt on a rough pavement and moreover weighs above four and a half tons. Consequently, according to the rules, it should have had six wheels. And as for being on springs, I must confess I could barely discover them. She is very ugly and the boiler runs out very much. He had to seal up her leeks with more meal and malt sprouts than would fatten a pig. He started bravely but didn't get half of his 70 miles done.
We have finished the grand experiments on the engines and the Stevensons have come off triumphant and of course will take hold of the 500 pounds so liberally offered by the company. None of the others being able to come near them. The rocket is by far the best engine I have ever seen for blood and bone united. From that moment on, the future of the steam engine will be safe for 140 years. The Liverpool and Manchester Railway bought the rocket and ordered a batch of engines to the same pattern from Robert Stevenson's in Newcastle. But rocket was by no means the first steam engine working on the line. For some months before Rainhill, two Stevenson engines had been doggedly at work, the Lancashire Witch and the Twin Sisters, hauling ballast trains and carrying men and materials. Work had proceeded well, and by early 1830, the greatest structure on the line was nearing completion, the Sankey Viaduct. I'm not on that train. This was indeed the first great railway bridge in the world. But it's not just for that that it's important. It also marks the crossing of England's first canal, the Sankey Navigation, by England's first real railway, the Liverpool and Manchester. It's also a classic example of Stevenson's tendency to change his mind and improvise. A sketch of his first idea for it has survived so we can compare it with what he eventually built. He intended it as a 20-arched Gothic structure 40 feet high. In fact, it ended up 60 feet high with nine semicircular arches. When the bridge was finished, people came from all over to admire it. Painters and artists absorbed it into their landscapes. Even the Iron Duke himself on the opening day was moved to call it magnificent, stupendous. Little wonder then that when George took Fanny Kemble on her tour of the line, he decided to stop the rocket over there and show her his bridge. So, the, uh, the filing for the phone. Now, for a word or two about the master of all these marvels with whom I am most horribly in love. He is a man from 50 to 55 years of age. His face is fine, though careworn, and bears an expression of deep thoughtfulness. Really? Indeed. Oh, I. Well, 45,200. His mode of explaining his ideas is peculiar and very original, striking and forcible. And although his accent indicates strongly his North Country birth, his language has not the slightest touch of vulgarity or coarseness. He has certainly turned my head. Special tracker down there, John, with you. It's odd to think, isn't it, that when this bridge was first built, engines weighed only around four tonnes. And now, 150 years later, this bridge carries engines weighing 20 times that amount. And it's never needed any adaptation at all. You've got to hand it to the man. But even a four-tonne engine could be lethal. On the opening day, the company had fenced off the line and warned each of the guests that the engines will stop at Parkside to take in a supply of water, during which the company are requested not to leave their carriages. But the occasion was a festive one, and a lot of the guests ignored the warning. They just wanted to admire the scene and pay their respects to the Duke of Wellington. Among them was the MP Huskisson, the man who'd done the deal with the Marquis of Stafford to make the railway possible in the first place. Some people reckoned that he saw the stop at Park Side as a chance to make his peace with the Duke. He'd had a quarrel with him. Whatever the reason, on this glorious day of triumph, tragedy struck. A German film of the 30s reconstructed their own version of what happened in this first railway accident in the world.
Huskisson didn't die immediately, but was rushed by train to Eccles, eight miles away, where the nearest doctor was. He survived the accident for only nine hours. But his wasn't the first death on the railway. Many navvies had died, and they didn't get marble monuments like the one that Huskisson got. If they were married, their widows got £10 compensation, and that was it. What was startling about Huskisson's death was that it took place in full view of hundreds and on the worst possible day for a scheme which more than most needed good public relations. The Iron Duke was all for turning back, but he was advised that the waiting crowds in Manchester would riot if he didn't arrive. He took the point. But the band that travelled with them was sent back to Liverpool. The Duke and the others went on to Manchester, but there was no cheering or flag waving. This calm, flat expanse of land seems a long way away from dying MPs and bitter controversy. But it was the greatest single obstacle which Stevenson had to overcome in building the railway. It's a bleak, damp, cold sort of place, Chat Moss. Even today, after three weeks of dry weather, which is pretty rare up here, there are patches all over as squelchy as this, quite nasty. But back in the 1820s, the whole place was nothing but a total quagmire of 5,000 acres slap bang in the route of the railway. Mr Giles, to whose testimony you may pay considerable attention, states that no man in his senses would go across Chat Moss. Mr Giles says he would go round Chat Moss, but the railway company have chosen to go through it. And so the railway company must stand or fall with Chat Moss. Now, Mr Stevenson believes the moss to be 15 feet deep. He then discovers it may be 37 feet deep. On a sudden, he changes and says, oh, if that be so, I shall immediately make two impossible drains by the side of the moss, and when I have cut them, I shall have the moss reduced to a solid body, and I shall then lay my sleepers. But his estimate for the railway has this remarkable property about it. Whether he cuts or tunnels or drains, by some singular coincidence, it always ends in the sum of £400,000. Now, Mr Giles says, if by some fatal star predominating, the company should go across Chatmos, unless you, the committee, are to save them from their own folly, the whole expense of the railway must necessarily be upwards of £800,000. Alderson was wrong on all counts. Stevenson did build the line across the moss. He cut the two impossible drains and floated the track between them on a lattice of brushwood hurdles interwoven with larch trees and heather. And it was the cheapest section of the railway to make. It's the same today as when it was built, and it still gives the smoothest ride on the line. This was Manchester's terminus, Liverpool Road, and just like the terminus at the other end, it too is now backwater. It was superseded by Victoria Station, became a goods depot, and then was abandoned. But it is the oldest surviving railway station in the world. And it was here that the Duke of Wellington arrived at about three o'clock on the opening day. Now remember, he'd been warned that if he didn't come, there could be riots. Well, he did come, and a large section of the crowd was very hostile towards him. They were waving banners and shouting things like, remember Peter Lou, vote by ballot, no corn laws, all of them, hot political issues of the day. The revolutionary tricolour flag was being displayed all round. The whole atmosphere was pretty nasty indeed. Now up here in the goods warehouse, what was described as a cold collation had been prepared, and some of the guests pushed their way through the crowd and had a bite to eat. The Iron Duke, however, he stayed down there in his coach. He didn't really want to get out. There were enough supporters down there for him to shake a few hands and kiss a couple of babies. Before the crowds got too rough, the authorities loaded the guests back onto their trains and the Duke of Wellington steamed away. He didn't return to Liverpool as originally planned. Instead, he went off to have dinner with the Marquis of Salisbury. He'd been very upset by the death of Huskisson. And anyway, he'd probably had enough of trains for one day.
semana.